Thank you. Thank you again uh, for inviting me in the first place. Um, I think I, uh, Ian sent me an email about three, four weeks ago and asked if I can do one of these days, and uh, I immediately picked up the first date I could. Um, it's neighborhood from here, really, so um, not very far for me to come. Um, and what, huh? We're joining Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we are in the doghouse of the Big Ten, too, so we don't want to talk about Big Ten anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> we, I don't approach that subject anymore. <laughs> Maybe a year ago. <laughs> OK. Uh, so um, I was sitting and I was thinking about what we, uh, what I should be presenting for this talk here. And then um, in the last four or five years, uh, essentially about five, six years ago, we got a MRI grant, which uh, uh, part of it, we got a uh, RIEHR uh, as part of it. And uh, since then, I've been doing a lot of oxide material type etching and it put me onto a path of uh, quartz resonators that at that time I wasn't thinking much about. <laughs> But since then, we have been doing a lot of work in this area, and so I thought maybe it's a good way to, to present on one single topic um, the kind of work that we have uh, done in the last few years. And um, of course, the, the title, the pun, is intended in this case, and uh, uh, you, will, you will see that I believe in it uh, as well, that it's only a matter of time. But we'll see at the end. But if you ask too many questions and you're skeptical, then we'll see. OK, so the work is all done by uh, the students uh, who are listed here and postdocs. Um, and it's been funded in bits and pieces by various organizations. So what I will do is I will uh, give a very simple uh, outline instead of going into lots of details here. I'll just talk about uh, why quartz MEMS. Uh, I'll talk about why micromachine quartz. Give you two major motivations. And then the last part, I'll just give you some examples of the kind of things that we have done. Um, and then you can, um, you know, uh, in the various areas here that I've listed. And then I'll wind up by uh, talking only uh, as a matter of time uh, what, what it means really in the uh, title. OK, so why quartz? OK, so first of all, you would think quartz should be easy to make. It's silicon dioxide. But actually, it is, it is really difficult in the sense that if we could grow thin films of quartz, I wouldn't be giving this talk today. All right. Um, essentially, it's not been possible to make piezoelectric quartz thin films on a, by any process, um, which, which give you uh, films of any quality. And so therefore, what has happened is it's, it's been relegated to only one thing, and that is basically uh, whatever keeps our time, really, right? Um, and when you look at it, it's an obvious material of choice. It's silicon dioxide. It's glass. It's everywhere, right? And it's got this amazing frequency stability. When you look at it, what is the noise and frequency at room temperature? It's just one of the best materials out there, right? Um, which then means that if you can make 100 megahertz resonators, you have frequency fluctuations less than 10 to the power minus 4 hertz, which is essentially the reason why, I mean, we are using it as, as the time reference to start with, right? And so that, of course, gets, got me motivated at that time. But more importantly, here is what it is. If you were to just do very simple analysis, which is the Sauerbrei equation, we all use it, quartz crystal resonators exist in you know, evaporators, so on and so forth. We don't think much about it. But the ultimate mass resolution is given by 5.3, 10 to the power minus 15 times A, the area of the resonator. Now, if you go and buy a commercial resonator, it's about the size of a quarter. I mean, that's what I'm sure most of the quartz crystals look like. So the point is, of course, they have an area which is in the centimeter squared. When you put it all into this, it's not going to look very amazing, especially in comparison to the cantilever world, which has been doing gravimetric sensing uh, you know, for the last 10 years. And they get, go into zeptograms and so on and so forth. Now, I look at this and I go, I mean, what is it that we cannot do about it? Well, we'll look at it in a minute. So if you were to actually take a 100 micron diameter resonator, OK? and you use that as your uh, ultimate mass resolution, then you can actually, on a 100 micron, which is a very large diameter sensor, actually, it's nothing very tough to make. Um, it is 4.2 10 to the power minus 19 grams. 21 is Zepto. So we are almost there within a factor of 100. You can make it to 10. If you make it to 10 microns, then you will be in the Zeptograms. So here's the challenge. So why is it that we can't make it? Well, the simple answer is the following. 
If you make the resonator laterally very small, it becomes more of a three-dimensional structure, right? If you have a very thick quartz, it becomes three-dimensional and the energy trapping is lost and the energy leaks away and you have very poor quality factor devices. Okay, if you make them relatively very large in comparison to the thickness, you get a lot of spurious modes. And spurious modes also spoil uh, your ability to sense because then the resonator jumps between all these modes. And that's really uh, is, is what is at the, at the heart of this problem. So what is required is to, if you want to make a uh, resonator that's 100 microns in diameter, you need it to be roughly 10 microns in thickness. And that brings you to the point as to where can you find a 10 micron quartz. And if you do find it, how do you deal with it? Because it's too, too difficult to, to, to handle. And so that's where this whole business that I started with, which, which is the uh, oxide etching tool, comes back into picture because for the first time we can actually get bulk crystals and we can micro machine the quartz down to that thickness of six to five to 10 microns range and therefore we can make these resonators. And that's basically how I got started into this area. The other advantage is unlike cantilevers where you have to immerse them into liquid environment, then they get sloshed around in every which way with the, with the fluid movement. The big advantage of the quartz is you can actually load them only from one side, from the top side, for example. And that allows you to not have any interference. The backside remains dry, essentially, and you, know, you can have your electronics and stuff. So inherently, it was a obvious choice in terms of doing biotype sensing, right? And that's really where um, we, I, I was wanting to go. And if you look at what is the mass sensitivity inside a liquid, of course, it gets a little bit worse because of the fact that there is the viscosity of the liquid coming in here. You do find that as you will increase the frequency, the ultimate sensitivity for pure mass loading is independent of the frequency. It doesn't matter whether it's a high frequency resonator or small, uh, low frequency resonator. But inside a liquid, you actually benefit by having a higher frequency resonator. Because this is a bulk acoustic wave resonator, as you thin the wave resonator down, your frequency, of course, keeps increasing because the thickness is half wavelength, acoustic wavelength. So um, that's the real uh, benefit in the end. So we are doing two things automatically. As you s squeeze the resonators laterally, you have to thin them down, and you automatically increase the frequency. All three of them tie together and work towards um, you know, a better sensitivity. So this is really the goal in terms of uh, what we were doing. Now, these are the two uh, simple cases that I've explained to you in terms of applications. But, uh, if we were to really do um, applications uh, of these devices, um, we're looking at more like biological materials, and th these are neither liquid-like nor solid-like, so they're more like the viscoelastic uh, um, you know, films that are loading up. Now, if you look at it, this is a simulation that's based on a model, which I'll be coming up to a little bit later, but I just want to put it into the motivation. Why micromachine? I'm still giving an uh, argument here. If you look at it, this is the dissipation factor. This is the viscosity uh, and the elastic modulus of the film that is growing on top or that's being put on top of the quartz resonator. This is the commercial 5 megahertz resonators. That's about 330 microns thick. And when you look at it, it has got very poor resolution in terms of the modulus viscosity uh, you know, space. It's a very, very small area in which it is, it's going to work, um, and otherwise it just doesn't work in any other area in the rest of it. Whereas if you look at the higher frequency resonators, in this case it's at 30, 65 megahertz, and if you go for higher and higher frequencies, you can actually expand that. So what happens is the viscoelastic property resolution improves as you also improve the frequency of the resonator. So this is another big benefit in terms of uh, what you're trying to achieve in terms of these uh, resonators. Okay, so with that, I mean, you know, the motivation is why micromachine quartz in the end? And there will be other reasons I'll come to and, uh, when I'll uh, show you the other um, applications. But for now, this is how we got started. And the other thing is now uh, the problem of statement in terms of etching. It wouldn't have been possible if not for the fact that we were able to achieve some reasonable etch rate. And right now we are actually working, as I speak to you, to improve this by a factor of 10. Okay, so there are some ideas that we are exploring, but we haven't gotten enough um, so for me to present here, but we are just starting that. Um, so what it is, is um, 
right now, the edge rate that you can get for quartz is anywhere between 0.5 microns to 1 micron. We can do up to 1 micron, but the surface roughness increases, and if you're making resonators, that's terrible in terms of quality factors. So you really have to make them very smooth. Yes? What type of machine is your ICP? Is it the helium pipe? It's an Alcatel. It's an Alcatel um, helium-cooled backside, helium-cooled mechanical clamp. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an ICP RIE. It's uh, typically it's yeah 2,500 watts on the ICP side. It's it's got a lot of range. Yeah. Um, and of course, as you I'll tell you later on, that is part of the problem that we are all stuck in, um, and that is that when you try to go with these ICP RIEs, the edge. It sounds like you have fancy machines that are doing great stuff, but what they're doing is they're basically breaking every molecule that comes in their way into indiv individual uh, atoms, and then you're just taking these atoms and banging as hard as you can onto your quartz and then etch it that m uh, in that manner. And that's really what uh, gets you to this 0.53 or 0.6. Uh, this is basically uh, an ion level uh, sandblaster, if you want to think about it. That's all we are doing, and that's that's where we are. But this this is reasonable in the sense we use about 100 micron quartz uh, blanks. That's what we use because we can handle them. And out of the 100 microns, we take about 90 microns, you know, anywhere between 80 microns, 90 microns out. So fabrication is, for these, very simple. As I say, keep it simple so that we can actually go and do the real things, that is, try to understand the, the biological materials and stuff like that. So we just etch a, a pit, which is, as I said, 10 microns at the bottom. You put the electrodes on the top and bo bottom side. You can also do, um, you know, actuate these wirelessly if you want uh, because they will couple to uh, the RF radiation, but it tends to be rather poor coupling in that case. So you get much better coupling if you just do the electrodes. So we have a very simple method by which we, and of course we don't make one single resonator, the whole idea being that you want to make arrays. So the standard array, we have like eight resonators in there. There's no reason to limit to this. We can make as many as we want, but really we don't have way to deal with, electronic, with the electronics. So eight is plenty for now. Okay. Um, so the real fabricated device looks more like that. You've got you, each of your resonators. Um, you know, things are not as, as good looking, but the resonators actually work quite uh, well in this case. And I'll show you some of the uh, characteristics of it. And we package them in a very, uh, very, very uh, uh, nice manner. What we have done is we've taken a standard dual inline package, which is a ceramic package. We cut this hole in that dual -line, ceram uh, line, uh, ceramic package using water jet cutting. So you have a nice, uh, uh, square hole in the middle, and then we actually use silicone to, to attach the, the resonator from the backside. You have to be very careful. If you do even a slight thermal mismatch when you're attaching them, the resonator's quality factor degrades very rapidly. So you have to do this right, and if you can do this right, then you can actually get a very, very good uh, performance out of them. And it makes it very easy. As you can see, we can put a Teflon cell. We can just put an O-ring, which seals on the front side. You can have flow through this, or you can do just static testing, whatever you want to do. So in terms of what, when you're doing biology, this is a very big part of it. You want to keep the liquids and your electronics away from each other. And the top electrode is the ground electrode. So it's really nice. You're applying RF only from the backside, essentially. You're grounded at the top, and the liquids are always safely away from it. If you do this, probably with this packaging, you can at least use for six months repeatedly. Even then, the silicone many times doesn't give up unless you're doing something nasty with it. So really, it's a very, very robust package in terms of uh, what you can do. And as you can see here, this is your liquid hole. It's been all tied together. So it's, and you know, you have nicely your electrodes coming out from the side, you wire bonded from the back side. That's a very simple package actually, and but very effective in terms of what it can do. Now going back to the uh, uh, resonator for a moment, um, you know, this is the standard, the Butterworth Van Dyke model. This is the lumped element model for how uh, the resonator looks. Um, nothing new in here. All you're writing is uh, in terms of the equivalent uh, uh, parameters, what the uh, impedance or admittance in this case looks like. What is really nice is that if you write it in terms of the admittance, the peak of the admittance, the real part of admittance, is really directly related to motional resistance, which means the friction of the 
the system, okay? And you want that, that motional resistance is directly related to losses of your resonator, whether it's from um, the coupling or material or whatever. And so um, you can also write it as an equation of a circle if you want to, uh, you know, repeat or rewrite it. So this is the 66, 65 megahertz resonator. Typically, you get a very nice characteristic out of it. Uh, Q factors, we can get up to 50,000, actually. This is greater than 25,000. Uh, no problem in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 perf uh, the performance. And you can see this as I wrote here. This is the equation of a circle. The blue line is the, uh, the actual uh, measurement, and the red line is the, the circle fit. It's, it's very, very good in terms of the, the resonator itself. So 50 ohms, um, the, the emotional resistance. Uh, this is very typical of what we will get. And we have made resonators that are six microns thick with the same characteristics. So they are like 250 megahertz. So for bulk acoustic wave resonators, this is pretty high frequency in terms of uh, what it is. OK, so I break down my talk, and we'll see how it goes. If I'm going to take a long time talking about, I can skip the last part, uh, which is on magnetic sensing. But the way I've talked, I will talk about this is I've got three topics, gravimetric sensing, which is ma mainly looking at mass and viscoelasticity, second half, which is thermal sensing, and the last part is the, the magnetic sensing. OK, so we'll go over each of these. Uh, okay, so what we first started to do was we wanted to understand, one of my colleagues I was working with in chemistry wanted to understand how proteins, especially blood proteins, adsorb on um, surfaces. This was a question he raised, and you know people have been using traditionally the Langmuir isotherm, um, and there were lots of questions about what proteins do. And as I showed you in the motivation slide, one of the things that happens is that as you increase the, the resonance frequency, um, basically, it's a shear wave, okay? So the, the, the top surface of the resonator is essentially going in plane. And so what you're doing is you're taking a shear wave and inducing into this viscoelastic film. So eventually, because of its viscosity, the, the film, the, the acoustic wave dies in the, in the material, right? It, it's got an exponential decay. So there's only a certain distance, which we call the penetration depth, that you actually sample. Now, for a commercial 330 microns thick, 5 megahertz resonator, that depth is 250 nanometers, OK? So anything that is in the 250 nanometers above that surface or interface, it's actually looking at everything there. As you keep increasing the frequency, it actually keeps coming down. So for a 66 megahertz resonator, that is only 60 nanometers. And if you go up to um, 230 uh, megahertz, it actually becomes like 10 nanometers. This is greatly advantageous, because what is happening is you are only looking at the interfacial level at a very, very uh, small range near your surface. This gives you the advantage to be able to resolve the kind of things that you could not resolve with a commercial resonator, partly what that curve was showing, the 3D plot. And that's really what we were trying to do here. So um, this is a very, uh, again, a simple experiment. You, these are all gold electrodes, so you can use your thiol-based uh, chemistries to s modify the, uh, the surfaces of these. Um, and you can make a, either a hydrophilic or hydrophobic or uh, charged hydrophilic, because COOH actually becomes COO minus. Um, and so uh, you can make any of these terminations. And what we studied is four uh, so-called globular proteins. When I started, I didn't know any better. I thought globular means something that looks spherical, and they should be all just getting bigger and bigger, right? Globular, I mean. And so uh, we started doing it. And of course, as you do this, you realize things don't work in the way uh, that you, you thought about them in the first place. And they are very important because a lot of the work, with a lot of the stuff that proteins do on a surface basically mediates a lot of things that happen afterwards. Proteins is like the first step. The moment you will insert anything inside the body, for example, proteins will come. And you know they're starting to adhere. So we just wanted to understand what that is. Um, so if you do this, essentially what you're doing is you're taking different concentrations of the protein solutions, and you put it on the, 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 the resonators, and you monitor both the change in frequency and you monitor the change in the dissipation or the quality factor of the resonator as the concentration increases. So first idea will be that everything is following Langmuir isotherm, but as I said, they do not. The biggest difference between uh, proteins and Langmuir isotherm is that basically proteins, in the beginning, when the concentration is very low, you can adsorb and you can desorb by changing concentration. But once 
certain amount of time passes, the proteins actually go on the surface and they will go through a conformational change. Once they go through the conformational change, there is no getting them off. I mean, you can get them off, you have to denature them essentially, you have to do a UV ozone type clean. So we were starting to look with, on a CH3 SAM, I'm not going to show you all the results, I'll show you representative results because there are too many surfaces and too many of these proteins, so, and they, all not, they will not look very different from each other as curves. Lysozyme is one of the smallest proteins. It it is so-called the closest to a globular kind of shape. The next one, human serum albumin, is also not very different. What is more interesting is not only those curves, but what you can actually plot is frequency shift. That is, as a function, obviously, any time frequency shifting, concentration is changing. So another way to think is this is also concentration. But what you're looking for is a graph between frequency shift and the dissipation factor change, how the, the film is getting lossier. What this shows essentially is you can see a distinct behavior change in the different regions. As the concentration is getting higher and higher, the dissipation increases in this case. And it's kind of telling you something about the film. Obviously, this is an acoustic method. It's general. You're looking across a large area relatively in the sense of 100 microns. The, the proteins are pretty small, only nanometers in diameter. So it's, a, it's an averaged sort of behavior across all of them. But what you're learning from this is what is going on in the film as it is trying to build up. And I'll give you better examples as we keep going along this, this uh, thought process. So we do the same with each of these proteins, okay? So, and we do this for each protein on each of the surfaces, okay? Um, and so we're getting our uh, frequency shift and Again, plot the, the dissipation. This is for human serum albumin in this case. So this is a somewhat bigger protein. And a little still continues to look, at least in your imagination, you can put a sphere around it. But it does get much worse as we go to the next one, uh, which is the immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is a Y-shaped protein. So this one actually does not even have any spherical shape. How is it actually? adsorbing on the surface in itself is a very interesting question. Now, more interestingly, is it lying on its side? Is there a concentration at which you know, they all rise up and, and get to another con configuration? Interesting questions in terms of what it is. Again, um, looking at this dissipation curve is essentially what will, will help us to, to, to think about these. I'll come back to all of this in a bit. First, I want to just show you a bunch of results. Now, the worst of the lot, is the human fibrinogen. This is a 50 nanometer long protein. It's just a thread, essentially, if you want to think about it. And it's got these terminals at the end, which will bind on, on the surface. And so essentially, you can think of these as being very tall hair-like structures than, than anything that is globular. And what you also see in this particular case is this very distinct change in the dissipation after a certain point. And, um, I'll come back to that in a, again, as I say, uh, once I'm done with showing you all of them. Again, I'm not going to go in all of this on all of the surfaces, but we do the same identical experiments in all of these cases. So, what is more interesting is let's try to interpret it. So, what we've done is we create a model in this case where you say there is your QCM or the, the quartz resonators uh, re electrode. This is a simple uh, model that is. Uh, Essentially, uh, essentially, you're putting a, a boundary condition which is periodic in plane. Uh, in here, you have a uh, thiol layer which is modeled as a rigid layer, so there's no dissipation. We just consider this as mass. And then you have your adsorbed protein layer, and then you put the, the liquid on the top, which is just considered to be a Newtonian liquid. So you have viscoelastic layer, Newtonian fluid, and then an ideal mass layer. So with these three layers, you can essentially solve this as a, a simple problem um, of differential equation, one dimensional, because the lateral dimensions don't essentially, you don't consider to be uh, important because it's very large in relation. So what you can do is by solving this through this continuum mechanics type of uh, modeling, you can actually write out um, the change in frequency as a function of the viscoelastic properties of the air absorbing protein layer as well as uh, in terms of the liquid that is sitting on top um, and also the quality factor change. And of course, this is not limited to single layer. You can do this for a general n number of layers. So that's why you have n equals one, two, three as you go on, okay? So why are we doing this? Eventually, you can think about this in two ways. We're doing essentially four experiments. We do this at the fundamental frequency and at the third overtone. 
If you do this, you're doing a change in frequency and a change in quality factor measurement. So essentially, you're making four measurements each time on every protein. You actually have four parameters that you want to know about the protein. Its thickness, the density of the protein layer that you've adsorbed, the uh, modulus, the elastic modulus, and the viscosity. So because you're doing four independent experiments and you have essentially four variables, assuming that you know everything about the, the PBS that you have on top, you can actually solve this pro uh, equation, except that it's a nonlinear equation, so you have to be careful about what you solve, unlike in a, a linear situation. So you need to use uh, judiciously the ANOVA table that you get after you do the fitting to make sure that you know, you're picking the right solution. So in this particular case, if you do this, um, you can actually resolve what you will say is the viscosity and the modulus. And even if you say that I'd not, I'm not so sure about you know, breaking it down into you know, how, how good is your theory in terms of breaking it down, you can definitely do the breakdown in terms of loss tangent, which is basically a ratio of those two, and mass per unit area, which is a product of the density and the thickness of the film. So if you don't want to resolve it all together into the four parameters, you can resolve this in terms of these two areas. And so when we do this, essentially, um, something uh, very interesting comes out of these in, in terms of what you're looking at. First of all, what you realize is that the fibrinogen films are extremely lossy in this case. Okay, I mean, these are extremely large values in comparison to anything there. And what it's telling you is that there is a process in here. Remember, this is that very tall, long protein. So basically, I think these high frequencies are causing these um, uh, very thin uh, films that are that the hair-like structures to essentially dissipate a lot of energy as, as you get in, uh, in into this, this uh, range. Now, the other one that is really un, uh, I wasn't unexpected was this one here, the lysozyme. And and the other thing you realize on lysozyme is that it's got a very large mass per unit area. What, you, what it's telling you is this is not adsorbing as a single layer. There are lots of them falling on top of each other and adsorbing on. So this being a small protein, I think that's what it is doing in terms of uh, what's going on. We are in the process of doing some microscopies on these to also confirm the kind of things that is going on here. Uh, but what this, this whole thing can do for you is you can actually look look at um, the acoustic dissipation and come up with an understanding of the kind of film you're for forming on top of the resonators. And you have some idea in terms of what is the viscous losses, or what are the viscous losses, and what is the, the mass per unit area. Now, if this was kind of, OK, how can you be sure that what you're doing is right? I mean, this was also a question for us. I mean, after all, I can weave another 100 stories about what the protein is doing, uh, and I'm not really seeing it. So an, an interesting problem was, well, OK, so we've always been doing proteins. How can I actually make multi-layers that I'm absolutely sure. So the easy answer for that was, well, if we can use biotin avidin type of interaction, then what, can, what we can do is we can put a layer of biotin, then we can put an avidin, and then a biotin on top, and an avidin, and keep growing this. And the interesting question would be, what would such, such a system do? And so what we did is, in an, another experiment, we, we essentially put a uh, biotinylated uh, bovine albumin, which is a little bit larger protein. And what we are doing is basically um, putting the avidin and then the biotinylated uh, layer and then so on and so forth, okay? So when you do this multi-layer, you can see the frequency change and the quality factor change. Um, and here is the model for that. And you can see this, that you can actually do a very good simulation for what you're putting on top and what is the experimental results. So the, the red layer is the fitting and the blue is the, uh, the actual experimental results in this case. But what we are have to do in order for us to fit this is actually use a viscosity which is a function of the layer. So you kind of ask yourself, if it's the same layer, why is it a function of the layer itself, right? I mean, why, why is the viscosity changing? It's a material property. Well, what we do not know for sure is how is the interface? That means when biotin and avidin come together, how is the loss happening there? We do not know, and we did not account for that in the model itself. So therefore, what this is telling us is that as assembly of proteins occur into a multi-layered structure, the interfaces are degrading 
essentially and becoming lossier in, in the way uh, you're looking into it. And so therefore what is happening here is that um, you can see that viscosity is in the end a layer dependent uh, feature if you want to think about it. So these kind of things are kind of trying to tell you what's happening at the interfaces of proteins. So if you were to put things together on surfaces, we can uh, have some idea about what, what the various layers are doing in, in, in a, uh, so this is a typical gravimetric sensing. Of course you can do the standard mass type measurement work as much as you want to do, but those are less interesting in terms of um, you know, the actual applications. So here is, for example, an application for a label-free DNA detection. We, we, you know, this would be an obvious in this, in this case. Um, and what we did is uh, essentially put um, uh, uh, these uh, single-stranded DNA uh, molecules, these are uh, thiolated molecules, we, we get them thiolated, and then you can adsorb them on the, sur on the surface. Remember, we have lots of quartz resonators, so the question is, we don't want to be just putting one DNA and then just put the, the, the complementary strand and show that it binds, what, there's no big deal in that. What you want to do is be able to do different functionalization on each of these pixels. That's not so easy, because it takes some time for the, uh, the, the binding to occur in this case. So the easiest method that we came up with is you put one material or one, one of the strands and let it adsorb on all of the resonators, on all of them. And then you can use electrochemical methods to desorb. So you pick the one that you want to take things off and that cleans up. And once it's cleaned up, you can adsorb the next DNA on it, and then you can go on like this. So essentially, by addressing the front electrode separately, you can actually do um, adsorption uh, of different DNA strands, so that you can now take a mixture of all the complementary strands, put it on all on 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 this uh, resonator array, and then eventually you can look at. So starting to go towards the array type. So remember, we are kind of I'm trying to slowly move from um, you know one problem to a, a really sensing system type of a problem. And of course, you have to make sure that whenever you have this, uh, there will be some empty uh, sites that will be left and that you block them up by using um, short chain uh, thiol molecules. Those are just to make sure that you don't get um, false positives. So once you're done, for example, here are two functionalizations that we were, we were doing here. You can see there is a, a, and of course, in this particular case, we put the fluorescent uh, markers on them so that we can confirm what we are seeing is what is happening. Um, so what we have is two of them, each marked with a different fluorescent label. One is green and one is pink. And then when you do the, and you take a mixture of the two and you put it on, you can see that the, the uh, Pixels that were functionalized with one type uh, only glow here, and you can see that when you look on that pixel with the green uh, for the green fluorescence, you get nothing. It's it's black here, and vice versa here. You can see there is no no green in this case, so uh, no pink. Um, and so what it confirms is that there is a pathway for functionalization if you're thinking about it. Of course, the easiest way is to go and do some spotting if you can, but the thing is that for DNA, if you're trying to do a thiol-based uh, growing, you need time for them to actually um, have the binding, okay? Yes? It's very, very clean. I mean, when you desorb uh, after one of these steps, uh, you can pretty much, you know, it's a very dilute solution of DNA. So when you put it on, um, it'll, it'll form, and after you clean it, it, it just, there is nothing that is left. You can thoroughly clean. And these DNA molecules, I mean, of course, you can see, I didn't do, we didn't do this with proteins. Proteins would have denatured with, through all that. But cleaning and all DNA molecules are very resilient to it. And so your surface comes out very clean. Actually, in some cases, it could be very clean after electrochemical desorption. You may have cleaned some gunk too along with the, the DNA. So you get a pretty decent, now we've done this for up to three functionalizations. Now I can't tell you if you did this for 100 functionalizations what will happen, that may be a good question. At some point it may be a problem, but at least few, few uh, functionalizations is not a, a big deal. So basically it's a, this work is not so much about sensitivity as it is more about how to create uh, functionalization that is easy. If you think about the whole thing, it's actually fairly simple. You just pour the liquid, you just leave it for about an hour, you come back, and you just have to know which electrodes you want to desorb. You just put a little bit of a, a current uh, through it, and then you're done. It's just off. It's clean. 
and then you just pour out everything and it's done in very simple solutions like um, you know water PBS and alcohol in the in, in so it's it's a very easy process that's very critical because you know tinkering with these endlessly is is a very painful process of trying to do them so it was it's always one of the focuses that i'm at least looking at because biosensing is very complicated in terms of getting you know good results out of out of the system so one of the problems with this mass sensing as i've shown you up till now is that it's kind of blind you, you know in all of these cases we know what we are putting and every time i see results like this when you know somebody says i've detected it i know what i put and i show you again uh, what i have put exactly and we're all happy about it it's it's not very very meaningful as an exercise. Really, samples need to be unknown for you to be do doing this kind of stuff. So as you look into it, the big question that will arise is, yes, you can do all this kind of mass, but you'll get a mass change. And now you don't know what caused mass change in a real sample, right? So we need to have some way of also being able to identify molecules. So at that point, the idea came along, we need some kind of a simple spectroscopic method so that we can also do, because you want to move away from labeling. So if you want to move away from labeling, you need some kind of um, spectroscopic methods. So thinking about Raman spectroscopy, um, it is a given because we are putting gold electrodes, we can make nanoporous gold. And so this is a very simple method for making nanoporous gold. This is about 30 nanometer um, gap here uh, in these pores. Um, and uh, these, this gold is made by doing a silver gold alloy deposition and then leaching away the silver. Um, and then you get this very nice nanoporous gold. You can make it about 15 um, nanometers or so thick. And it, you can pattern in the same way because it's a noble uh, metal, so it's easy to pattern. But what you get is the surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy to, uh, signal out of it. So if you combine QCM arrays essentially with SIRS, in a way, you can get away from this problem of labeling and you can do the, the uh, identification. And again, as a proof of concept, we did the same experiment that we, we've done before. And of course, you get the additional advantage that because of the additional surface area, your signal now becomes much larger than it was before in terms of uh, what you're seeing, uh, in, in terms of the quartz. Uh, uh, but more importantly, you get a very nice sur surface uh, enhanced Raman spectra. And these uh, particular peaks can then be used to identify essentially molecules um, as a way to, to get it. So, what SIRS does is gives you a qualitative identification of the molecules that are on the surface. What QCM does is actually quantifies it in terms of how many mass or how much mass per unit area, and therefore the molecules that you have. And that's really um, one of the things that we have gotten to in terms of um, doing this. So we have a way by which we can functionalize. We have a way now by this dual method that we can do both um, um, uh, uh, molecule identification and quantification, essentially. Um, okay, so going on with it, I will talk to you a little bit about thermal sensing. So along comes, uh, you know, I'm doing this work, and then everybody is always talking about 80 cut quartz. 80 cut quartz is the quartz that is, you know, the time's reference, right? So you kind of go, well, is there a cut of quartz that is t temperature sensitive? And you realize that actually all cuts of quartz, except for 80 cut quartz, are temperature sensitive. In fact, if you take a Y cut quartz, it's extremely t sensitive to temperature. It's got a 90 parts per million um, sensitivity to temperature. And so the idea then was, if we can micromachine quartz, we can actually make it into a typical MEMS structure, and it could be put together into an infrared detector because you can you know, use it to, to absorb. Now, actually what is very interesting is that quartz has a very, very good absorption at 10 microns, which is exactly the, the wavelength that you're looking at. Um, and so without needing any absorbers, you can actually make very good quartz resonators out of it. Okay, and I mean uh, very good infrared sensors out of it. And the pixels, because of the method that we are using, if you can integrate onto a silicon structure, Okay, can be made into a very nice resonator that you can put together, which is freestanding and very thin. And this really is uh, the second part that I'm going to come up, and then I'll show you how it comes along to become a biochemical sensor again. So eventually we'll, we'll come back to this biochemical sensing uh, in the form of thermal sensing in this case. So we started doing this work, which is exactly the kind of resonator which is shown here. This got a small thermal mass. This is about six microns or so thick, this quartz. And it's just the same, it's a bulk 
wave, acoustic waves resonator. Now, if you think about it, if you have 230 megahertz resonator and 90 parts per million, you have 22 kilohertz per degree Celsius of frequency sensitivity. And if you really have even a tenth of a degree stability in the system, in terms of the frequency stability and noise, you've got basically into micro Kelvin of resolution. Nothing that I know of has phenomena that gives you micro Kelvin resolution. Now in the end, it will not have micro Kelvin resolution because you put it at room temperature and the KD fluctuations at room temperature is what is going to limit you in the end. But that's separate from the fact that the material itself has that sensitivity. So if you cooled it down, you can actually get into the micro Kelvin, okay? And that, that is really very powerful. Now I was doing thermal sensing work before and we were using thin film thermocouples and stuff like that. They just never had adequate sensitivity. So eventually we were limited by, you know, the noise that we were getting out of the thermocouples. And so we had to give up on, on, on those methods. But once I came across the quartz resonator, I was absolutely convinced it's the way to go. We developed an entire fabrication process which includes indium uh, solder bonding. So we actually pattern the indium and we put it only in certain areas in, on, on top of a wafer. You bond the whole glass, I mean the, the quartz on top, then you thin it down by the same RIE process without patterning. After it's become about six microns, you spin photoresist and then cut the, the you know, the isolating fingers or whatever the, the, the supports. And then you get this nice resonator and it's on a freestanding uh, structure on a silicon uh, substrate. I know that the pictures of the devices don't look as beautiful, but they are actually quite, uh, quite reasonable in terms of what they are. Um, they are. These are pretty reasonably big resonators. We had best success with larger ones. Um, uh, we can make smaller ones actually. It's not like, huh? Huh? You cannot see it. The bonding is, is right here. Yeah, but what part is what indium. Indium solder. indium solder. Yeah, so you put the indium and it's a solder which is 150. Remember one of the big problems we will have is we cannot generate much stress in the quartz, otherwise it will lose its quality factor. So we have to keep a very low thermal budget. Actually, it will be better to go off into a polymer type uh, burning at some point um, if, if this is to be. Uh, these are about uh, 500 microns, so the circle in this case is about 500 microns in this case. Uh, or maybe, maybe smaller, I can't remember. These are either 500 or 200 microns. Uh, these are not because it was, it was having a lot of trouble in, in getting a lot of large arrays in this case, yeah. Um, but you get your resonators, but as I said to you earlier on, you get your 22 kilohertz per degree. That is the temperature sensitivity, right? Um, and they are the 6.9 microns in terms. Now here comes the problem. So up till now, the way we were measuring the resonance frequency is we would actually do a frequency scan. Frequency scan of 800 data points, you're doing it around the resonance frequency. It will take you, even if you do the fastest scan, about six, few seconds, right? It's too slow for you. And this is not going to make any useful electronics. What kind of electronics? So you can think about making a resonator or something out of it, uh, an oscillator circuit. That's a possibility. But you know, with the viscoelastic, we were not doing it. So one of the things that came along in terms of thinking about this, um, uh, this kind of uh, resonators is um, you can actually come up with a very new implementation, which is a very simple implementation for the, uh, uh, the resonance measurement. If you think about it, here are the same curves of that uh, particular resonator. As temperature increases, it will move from the blue to the red, or if it decreases, it will move from the blue towards the green. If you are measuring the impedance of this at this particular fixed frequency, which is right in the middle, this region is pretty linear, okay? We can't have very large excursions of temperature. If you're going to have very large excursions of temperature, you do not need a temp sensitive temperature sensor. You're really looking for very, very small temperature excursions. So in this linear range, you can actually just look at it as moving from one curve to another. Essentially, your impedance will fluctuate between the top, the green line, and the red line. So it's simply going up and down in terms of uh, what is happening. So if you just track the impedance at that particular frequency, which is just a very simple process to implement in terms of electronics, then you got everything you want. And additionally, what you get is a gain from the slope, pretty much like how we do this in the, in the transistors. It's not like we wanted the gain anymore, but you do get it if you want. And so suddenly, temperature measurement has become an impedance measurement now for a resonator. 
So this was a very nice simple uh, strategy that we used for doing the, the uh, measurements. Of course you want to make sure that it was a thermal sensor, sorry. Um, and to make sure of that it's a thermal sensor, you can see the nice uh, 3dB uh, thermal type performance in this case. Um, and if we go to the next one, it shows we just have a chopper in front of this cutting the infrared. We had a small lamp which was just a heater, th tungsten lamp in front, not focused. Um, these things actually are such good infrared detectors. You put your hand, you can get signals, tons of it. So these, these can be used as room temperature imagers without any absorber. It's just an amazing temperature sensor. Actually, if you look very carefully at this, the red line is our sensor. The blue line is actually the reference sensor we bought from a store. So normally it's always the other way. I was always used to signals being the, the blue way and, and, and reference. And you can even see that here the time constant is still, uh, we, I think we are following the, the chopper in terms of the, you know, it's cutting the, the, the beam across. So it's not even stabilizing. So it's, it's kind of a, a fairly uh, good um, temperature sensor. So this is basically uh, what we have done is we have converted this mass measurement into a temperature measurement. So at this point infrared detectors you can make but you know how infrared detectors are right now. The commercial infrared detectors the pixel size is 17 microns. You're kind of going do I really want to make a 10 micron quartz pixel which will be one micron thick and I have to etch 99 microns and end stop on one micron. That's going to be tough. It's possible probably we'll, we'll make one after three, four years of work, but maybe that's not a real production technology. So I kind of go, well, that's not something I really want to do anymore, right? So what can I do that we can use this, these resonators? And so I'm th sitting and thinking, and as I said, these have got excellent performance. So. 4 millikelvin, this NETD, which is actually, if you put the time constant and this NETD together, this is comparable to the vanadium oxide uh, bolometers that you can buy. Actually, it's better than that if you look at it. So this is just amazing in terms of the work. But the, the thing is, what do you do now? They're big, 200 microns pixel. Nobody wants it. So I don't have any choice of making staring arrays. So I'm sitting there and thinking about, again, coming back to that old thermal measurements of, that I was doing a long time ago. And this is a very traditional problem. I'm sure all of the students in this room realize this. You go into the lab, you work for about three months, you make your devices, and the first time you put the biological liquid, it takes about 15 seconds, the sensor is gunked up, and you have to throw it away. And when you're throwing that away, you're really sad because it's three months of work, you didn't get anything, all you got was gunk on top, right? And it's really, it's this the case. And after about three, four tries like that, your couple of good sensors are gone, you go back to the lab, again, three more months of work, right, fabrication. So this is a real problem in terms of what it is because by the time we really want to explore biology, it, the sensors are gone, there is no more to test. So you need something that you really want to be able to do lots of work with. And then the idea comes along that, hey, if I can create calorimetric sensors which produce heat output, then I can put them very close to my sensor. And I will never be touching my sensor. So my sensor remains clean as it is. Okay? And I can do whatever chemistry I want to do on what I, this disposable piece. So it's more like that glucose sensor where you buy the strip, you stick the strip in, and you throw the strip, and you're done. You get your result. And that's really the possibility of what you can do. Okay? And that's really how uh, we started moving back in terms of uh, uh, this bio biosensing using this. So when you look at it, the calorimetric sensor is very simple. You create a little reactor. It could be an open reactor. It can be a flow cell. We can do anything. And you just keep it very close. And all you have to do is just take this very small amount of heat with this micro Kelvin type resolution. The heat couples in, looks at the photons that are coming in the infrared, gives you a signal. And that's really all that it is in terms of what it is, uh, the sensor. Now, I had a uh, collaborator at the Hershey Medical School who was very interested at the same time looking at uh, creatinine in, in, um, uh, in acute kidney infection patients. So what he had as a problem, and by the way, creatinine right now is measured using a method called the Jaffe method, which is a very traditional method. And what, what you have to do is go through these test tube type operations one after another, and it's a color change method where you're looking at the picric acid changing the, the color, essentially going from orange to yellow or whatever. And it's a very slope method in, in terms of what you have to do. 
And so there is no continuous measurement method. And after that, the picric acid has to be thrown out and you have to redo the whole thing. And right now, the only accepted method of measuring creatinine or kidney dysfunction is to take serum creatinine levels and then you measure how much creatinine is there in the blood and then, you know. So if somebody is in actually uh, ICU with a ki acute kidney infection, how many times can you take the blood of this person? I mean, and so you do maybe once or twice a day and then you wait for the next day. By then, kidney has started to fail and in many cases in ICU, people cannot be revived. So actually, many cases ICU patients die because kidney has gone too far before the blood was able to see it. So one of the hypotheses, and this is not for me, my colleague's hypothesis is that if we can do this in real time, a, a, a measurement in urine, then it is much easy because almost all these patients have catheters in them, and so there is basically a free sample available all the time on the patients. So if you can do this, of course this is a new standard that has to be established, so there is an opportunity where MIMS, for example, can create an, a possibility. And that is, this is the current standard, if you can create a continuous measurement system, then you can probably come up with a correlation between the serum creatinine and, and the uh, urine creatinine. Yes? Yes? So, yes, yes, we put an enzyme. The enzyme is creatinine deaminase. Okay. So the creatinine deaminase will be functionalized on this. Okay. I, I'll, I'll come to that. And so it is very selective and only reacts with creatinine. Okay, and that, that's basically what we are trying to do in this case. Um, and so that's, that, uh, and of course there is a heat of reaction. It's a typical enzymatic reaction. We measured the enthalpy of that um, uh, using standard methods and it is enough that we will be able to see it. Um, in fact, it's pretty high uh, enthalpy for what it is. So if you look at it, it is basically a very simple measurement. Now what we want is we don't, you don't want variation from, from sensor to sensor, right? So if you try to hold it or you know, try to manufacture with an integrated channel, then the big problem is it's the same story. After you've done the measurement, you have to throw the channel, but the channel is sticking to the sensor, so both go. So the idea was that you want to keep your channel separate. And it's very simple. What we did is you just take your quartz resonator and stick it on the back of a steel plate. This is a 100 or 300 micrometer thick steel plate. You cut a hole in it, you stick it on there. You put your reactor on the top side of it. It guarantees that the space is always 100 microns because of that. Okay, until and unless you're using very thin membranes and using large pressure to drive your liquid, in which case then your, your membrane can flex and decrease the gap. And of course, if the gap decreases, the sensitivity keeps increasing. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, but very simple, this is a polystyrene weighing boat. It costs a penny, all right? And you take this PDMS, you, you don't even have need this PDMS, you can actually do it in open air. You can put a drop of the enzyme, you can put a drop of the, the analyte on top, and you'll get this big signal. When you're done, throw that one, one penny you know, weighing board away, your sensor remains as it is, you got your result. This is actually very, very powerful in terms of a, what you can do. So this is the non-contact measurement method. And the nice thing is, you can give this away to your uh, bio-collaborators, they can grow cells, now they can put it in 37 degrees in humidity. I don't care, before all my sensors were getting into humidity, when they come back, they don't work, right? So, so now you could do cell biology, you can do what you want really with this method. You just have to functionalize this little thing and, and go for it. So this was looking okay, but you know, here the problem is it's a temperature based measurement. You're doing this in an open pan, you know, heat is being lost to all the directions, not just going into your sensor. You want to have some control over this. And also going back to the creatinine problem, eventually you want to put this as an inline sensor on a catheter. So you need to have a complete fluidic solution in, th in this case. So we came up with a, um, an alternative for that, and I'll, I'll actually, before I go there, I'll just show you some results. These are kind of the boring, uh, again, straight line type graphs, which I don't pay much attention to, but just showing the feasibility. You can do this with urea, urease, glucose, glucose, oxidase, uh, creatinine, deaminase, and creatinine in this particular case. And all of these, uh, you know, you get these whole bunch of results. Eventually, you get calibration graphs out of them. But here is what 
eventually that we were interested in. Remember, what I want to do is put it into a microfluidic system. So you have a, um, you have a syringe pump, and you have this little um, uh, Teflon cell that we created. And then you have the stainless steel plate with the sensor on top. And then you just have this plastic plate that you actually uh, immobilize on. And right now, it is connected to an impedance analyzer. I will tell, tell you a few things that we've done here to get to a, a real systems level. So what we are using is about a 3 micron capped on film. That's all it is. And so you buy this for about $10, and you can cut it into little pieces. On each piece, you can immobilize whatever enzyme you want. So on top of this, we, for example, immobilize a little spot of urea, or I mean urease. And you just take it, and you put it on top of of this, you just invert it so it's facing the chamber, which is up there. And you take the stainless steel plate, put it on top of it. You can see that it's become yellow here because it's trapped underneath. You put these four screws, which just tightens the O-ring. It makes a seal. Your resonator is sitting on this side, which is always dry. And the liquid is flowing through that side. And you can do whatever you want in there, so in terms of what, what you're doing. And so here, what we have done is we are flowing urea. Uh, a little uh, you know, uh, amount of urea, then we switch it off, move it to buffer, just switch it, and then again come back to urea and then go back to buffer so you can start um, getting your calibration graphs and you can now have a much better control in terms of what's going on. Yes? So the enzyme stays on the cathode and come No. Uh, so you have to do this immobilization uh, uh, method, which we are using is a glutaraldehyde-based cross-linking. And before you do that, you have to do some kind of surface treatment with APTS, some kind of a silenization process on the, the Kapton. But these are you know, well studied. We are not innovating anything there. Just pick standard procedures from biology textbooks. Just follow it. Okay. <laughs> and the, the nice thing is, not only just that, if you keep the enzyme wet in PBS, at room temperature, for example, ureas we can have for 15 days. It doesn't lose its activity. You just have to keep it in PBS. So, so long as you, so if you're not making measurement every minute, you can just fill it up, the chamber with, with buffer, leave it in, and then do the measurement whenever you're ready. So the nice thing is, if you were to think about this, this is the paradigm of that glucose strip. You put it in the morning on one of these patients. You put it in, you tighten it, and you're gone. And then it's continuously measuring. All you have to do is write a program, write this whole um, fluidics sort of protocol. Um, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And then basically, it'll just fill, it'll do the measurement, it'll record it and keep it in. And you just have all your calibration graphs. And you can do some kind of a standard calibration. You can put a liquid that is your standard. Um, and you can, you can get what you want. This whole system can be calibrated very well. We can put planar heaters. Kapton heaters can be bought. You can put them on top. We've done the whole thermal modeling and everything. I mean, I'm not showing you, but the kind of the standard physical thermal model the system. So it's a very, very um, engineered, very well understood system in terms of what it is doing. Um, and you get very nice um, graphs. Again, as I say, I don't put too much value on these because you know you put the urea and you put the ureas and then you say, wow, you know, I'm 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 impressed by this. No, uh, the real point is that you need need the real samples. So you, but what it is, and I, I will come. So this is the next goal, and this is where we are headed towards, is that we want to have eight different functionalizations. Now, on a face value, it seems like it's very easy. After all, I can spot eight different spots, right? But here's the problem: you spot the eight spots, and you go and put the liquid on top, heats will be created differently at each spot. But because there is water on top, the water will short circuit the heat and will just smear it across. So in a very short time period, you cannot see the eight different signals. You just get an average of all the eight signals. So we cannot do it as simply as that. So we have to build eventually some kind of fluidic channel so that we can keep each pixel from crosstalking. That's what has stopped us from doing multi-analyte um, kind of sensing. Uh, in, in this case. But we are moving towards it. At least we can do two analytes to three analytes. Yes? You probably are, are going to try next actual patient we, we are going to. We are getting ready for that. So we are, so right now what we are doing is, first of all, we have taken this impedance analyzer, which is this big thing that, you know, Hershey Medical School is about 90 miles from us, so we can't go with the big impedance analyzer each time. So what we have done is we made a, um, an electronics box, which is about that kind of size, which will do the the impedance measurement at the resonance, like I showed you. It's a very simple uh, electronics. So we reduced the impedance analyzer from that to about that kind of size. And the other thing that I was telling you yesterday is that we 
about these uh, uh, microfluidic. Uh, uh, there is a company in California uh, that's making microfluidics uh, parts. So the syringe pump is about 100 microliters. It's about this size. It's a syringe pump of this size. So they sell it like a, like a breadboard, fluidic breadboard. You can buy all the parts. So there is a controller, and you can buy valves, and you can buy, there's a reservoir, about one milliliter volume. So you can put this whole thing with all your pumps and you know um, uh, valves that will put you through into a, a microfluidic circuit about that kind of size. So put the two together, and you can actually have an instrument which for the first cut would be not exactly a handheld, but it's much closer than the impedance analyzer that we, we started out. So we're moving towards that direction right now in terms of uh, completing this, and then the real uh, urine samples. We do have some fake urine samples. I mean, fake meaning they are already collected from patients, and maybe something has been changed in them. I do not know. But we have, and we have tested with those. And they are working in terms of the uh, output. Uh, so eventually, the idea will be to make it into a, a catheter and put, put this microfluidic system on it. OK, um, how am I doing with time? It's already five minutes past 5 o'clock. OK, so I will just take a couple more minutes. Is that all right? OK, so the last part of it, and I'll show you how how projects evolve. I mean, this is another story. I mean, I didn't know I was going to do this. OK, and this, uh, those of you who were at Hilton Head maybe saw some of this work. And I'm not going to go into the greatest of details. I just want to show you a little bit about it. Comes back to that viscoelasticity that we were talking about. So the idea was somehow to make a magnetic sensor. And it was not my original idea to make a magnetic sensor out of quartz resonators. But it happened that one of my colleagues was trying to make me do something else. And I got curious with this. and. The idea is very simple. If you were to go and put a ferrofluid on top of these quartz resonators, for the fact that uh, I told you that they are extremely sensitive to viscoelastic measurements, any changes in viscoelasticity will be very, very accurately detected by these quartz resonators. And you can see that magnetic field causes an enormous change in the viscoelasticity of these uh, resonators, I mean, of, of these ferrofluids. So what we did is very simple. You have your, your resonator. You just take a drop of this ferrofluid and put it on top. This is the first proof of concept, OK? And so what you do then is as soon as you put this, you try to make a measurement of the magnetic field that you put in. When we started doing it, it wasn't working very well. It was very noisy. It would be sometimes work, sometimes not. We realized very quickly that if you put a bias magnet that actually kind of orients the ferrofluid into a certain pattern, ferrofluids have these nanoparticles sized uh, of iron oxide particles in an oil-like base. Um, and, and each one of them has a, a, a covering on top so that they don't agglomerate and clump up. Um, huh? They're, they're, yeah, you can make very beautiful patterns with them. And so you put a little magnet underneath. It's not very powerful. It's a teeny magnet you put. But it biases it and kind of makes the first initial pattern. Once you have this initial pattern, if you then apply a magnetic field, uh, it's quite amazing that you can do magnetic field sensing in this case. And this was basically the idea here. But one thing that we also realize is that if the top electrode is only made from gold, it is not as good as if we put a high per, uh, magnetic permeability material, such as med glass. So we evaporated, or sputtered in this case, um, iron beam deposited med glass, uh, which is a, an alloy of iron and boron. And So what we do is we are measuring the resonance, but in the resonance, it will be showing as a viscosity change, essentially. I mean, that's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a resonance measurement. So if you go back to that curve that I was showing you on the impedance, the impedance will change if you want to think about it in the end, OK? Um, OK, so let me, let me go over uh, to the next one. And so this is just a background information in terms of what the ferrofluids are. We don't make them. We just buy these. It's standard you can buy. And uh, one of the things that you have to be careful, and you can do a very simple analysis to get what will be the change in the viscosity as a change of the motional resistance of the device. This is basically a very simplistic expression here that, that kind of explains what you're, what you're seeing in terms of the resonance characteristics. And what you have is a, the, the device under test. You, you put a Helmholtz coil. This is what is putting your horizontal magnetic field at this point. And, um, so you can put on-off square waves on this magnetic field, um, and you can track 
as I said to you earlier on, the, the, the resonance frequency. Um, and you can see this is a commercial uh, 9 megahertz resonator. If you do not put the MET glass film, you get this blue line, which is your output on just pure gold film. You get some, but it's not as good. But when you put the MET glass, it really focuses the magnetic field because it's a high permeability. All the field goes into that thin film, and so therefore you are able to get a much larger output out of this device. So you can see as we switch on and off, very nicely you can see. So again, it comes back to that question. So if five megahertz resonator can do this. Why do you want to do this with micro? Because you have a better resolution of the viscoelasticity. And if you have a better viscoelastic resolution with the micro machine device, you're going to be more sensitive in terms of uh, the ultimate magnetic field. Yes? So, so um, which kind of particles are you using? Like how big are they? Are they multi-core? They are all single core. Um, so the, let me go back. So the particles, I had a table there. So this is the particle, it's a Ferrotech EMG 911, um, and the particle diameter is 10 nanometers, 2% volume, um, density and viscosity of the liquid. These are the ones we have tried. Remember what it comes down to. We do not want, remember the penetration depth I told you is of the order of our 40 nanometers. So if we use very large, particles, then I'm afraid that we are looking at maybe just one monolayer. And we wanted to see a little bit of that chain formation that, that, that we think this is, I, I'll show you a picture that, that will make it a little bit, you know, this is up, this is still a matter of discussion, okay? So it's not uh, all certain, but I will show you something that might be revealing in terms of what it is. So this is again showing the same thing if you uh, have the med glass and if you don't have the med glass. So it's obviously clear that having med glass makes a difference. This is what I wanted to show you. This is an optical picture. This is with the same magnet, with the same magnetic strength, the, the bias magnet sitting on the bottom side. What happens is this is the traditional formation that you expect. You expect spindles to be formed on top of gold. So this is a gold film and you, you see the standard hexagonal column formation. This is on top of the med glass. Because the med glass does grab all the flux, I think what happens in this particular case is that it, it does do something different on that very low seeding level, the very uh, initial level, layer of, of the, the, the metal, that, that the, the, the ferrofluid particles that are adsorbing on the surface. So what happens now is the chain formation on the top gets affected by how the seeding is happening. And so we feel that whatever med glass is doing is affecting those first couple of monolayers of the beads more than uh, the, the overall. So if you have lots of it on the top, we're not even seeing it. We are just looking at this very, very thin surface layer. Okay? And, uh, well, just to show you, we are able to push this for 60 nano Tesla and if you were to go and take the signal to noise ratio, um, you know, conservatively, you're looking at 15 nano Tesla resolution. I think if we do a little bit better in terms of putting some um, structures that will focus the magnetic field and stuff like that, uh, we can probably get into the Pico Teslas at this time. Um, so without any optimization, we're looking at nano Tesla at room temperature. You know, flux gate sensors is what you're looking at for this type of uh, sensitivities. So again, a very nice, simple setup again, in terms of what it is. Only problem with this, I'll tell you where the problem is. It's a ferrofluid, it's an oil-based. If you don't seal it and you leave it alone, eventually the oil evaporates and the viscosity is continuously changing, so your sensor changes. So one of the other ideas we are thinking about, and we haven't completely thought about it yet, is to probably put the magnetic particles in uh, ionic liquids. So if you put in an ionic liquid, they basically don't evaporate. Pretty much they remain as liquids or we will have to seal it or seal it. This would be another method of doing, but ionic liquids is another thought process that we can think about because they're just more stable. So you can do a full analysis and eventually you can ask yourself what kind of uh, viscosity change we may be expecting in this particular case, what you're seeing, okay? All right, okay, so I will stop with this. I have two, two slides and I'll stop uh, after this. Um, what we are talking about is 
only a matter of time, okay? I come back to this, this issue of, uh, so what did we talk about? We talked about piezoelectric quartz for sensing application, but why is this a matter of time? Well, first of all, look at quartz. Quartz has an extremely poor coupling and electromechanical coefficient. So nobody wants to use quartz for anything useful. But on the other hand, quartz has very high quality factor. The intrinsic quality factor of quartz is one of the best. So for what it is, it's always going to be a resonator. And if it is a resonator, the only thing of relevance that we are talking of is time. That's the only thing you're measuring. It's the best time sensor above all. So all things we are converting into a temporal domain as we are making these measurements. We're taking whatever phenomena is, converting it into a temporal domain through the quartz sort of resonator. So if you think about it, it's just a matter of time in terms of measurement, not just only in terms of what I think is the possibility for quartz future, right? So um, if you look at it, basically these are all some of the, the uh, summaries of what, what I've talked about, so nothing uh, additional. Okay, I will stop. <laughs> <laughs>